In the year 2050, there'll be nine billion people. How do we feed them safely, fairly, and well? And make sure every mouth is fed. Big skies, big farms, big country. Nebraska, heartland of the USA. But is big the best way to feed the world? In Nebraska, three cows for every human. Beef here, a $6 billion a year business. In Nebraska, you'd expect everyone to think big. It's the American dream. Now, meet Ron Meyer. He's the kind of guy you might expect to support big agro-business or big capitalism, but Ron is an angry man. Big Ag is squeezing the smaller farmers out all the time. They have been for my whole lifetime, and it's just kind of accelerated more in the last 20 years. At least in this country and in this part of the nation, that's, that's happened. There's no coexistence anymore. I mean. The big farmers are looking to buy the small farmer out right now. Ron believes small farmers like him can feed America and feed the world. If there's a profitability in, in whatever you're raising, you can, you can feed the world with uh, smaller farmers. But is Ron right? He's part of a global debate. Here in the American heartland, the battle against Big Ag is being fought not by slow food hippies, but a Vietnam vet, Ron Meyer. Seems like nobody stays together anymore. Ron has just 400 acres, that's small round here, and 40 cattle. For me, I guess it's just... Uh, just being and knowing your animals and knowing the land that you're farming. Big scale, I mean, they they're hardly ever walk their land. They don't know the an animals as individuals. They're just numbers. Now, she, she just had a calf. That's the one that had a calf yesterday. And she, the calf is laying there, and if you'd walk towards her calf, she'd probably charge you. They're very maternalistic. They don't like people around their calves. Small egg would tend to focus on a family-sized operation where the family provided all the labor and reaped all the benefits, where a big egg is the survival of the fittest. It's not in everyone's self-interest to, uh, to just have a few people monopolize the uh, food industry. Ron's turned himself into an investigative journalist, writing on the dangers of small farms becoming like serfs to Big Ag's feudal lords, whose domination of the land is unsustainable. You have to become more politically engaged. Uh, you have to be more aware of the people who are in charge now, the big banks and the corporations. Ron's arguments against Big Ag and the way it's run echoed by some globally known writers on food and social justice. When you look at the United States, you'll, you'll see that it's an industrial agricultural powerhouse. It's one of the world's largest exporters of, uh, of, of commodity crops. And that has been bought by a range of things. I mean, the, the, you have huge farms here, massive farms that you know, sort of stretch as far as the eye can see. Uh, and the way that those farms are economically viable uh, is because of a sort of mixture of government support and subsidy uh, and the a kind of outsourcing of the environmental costs of farming in that particular way so you're uh, you're creating a model of agriculture that you know, th that's driven by uh, an export economy that depends on vast amounts of cheap fossil fuels and on uh, predictable rainfall and uh, on you know a, a soil base that uh, of soil fertility that is being plundered at the moment um, 
And as the drought in the Midwest and the United States has shown, that model of farming is pretty precarious. Uh, it, I mean, it, it, when it works well, it, it seems to work very well indeed. But it has significant environmental costs and it's fragile. Hey, hey, hey. So now say hello to Big Ag, the annual get-together of the Nebraska beef industry, the Cuming County Banquet. Last year at this time, about, uh, what do you think, Gerald? 10 or 15 minutes before we were supposed to cut meat? Yeah. Didn't have any knives. Everybody forgot to get the knives. For the first two seconds, it was total chaos. We are set up to have 600 people, but with the weather, I have a feeling uh, there's going to be, we're hoping still to get uh, four to 500. I, I, I still think there, we might have 10 to 20% no-shows, but... The diehards will still show up. That's a knife, I'll tell you. That's a good knife. These are the big ag diehards, some of the biggest players in the meat industry in Nebraska, from ranchers through to meat packers and distributors. The big topic at their annual get-together, how to deal with the lobby for government intervention from small-scale farmers. We're all in this together. You know, we're a, a big industry, but there's not a lot of us. That includes the ranchers, the feedlot operators, the, the packers, the processors, the purveyors, the retailers. Yeah, you know, we've got to work together because we've got a lot of people out there working against us. Big ag on fight. the defensive. Though around here, they believe it's small ag whose glory days are over. Things have changed. Uh, you just can't do things like you used to do it. Uh, it, it. I can give you numerous examples. I used to have a neighbor that had a quarter section of land, and uh, that's what he and his wife lived on, made all their living on. Uh, now, uh, you just can't do it that way. Uh, the prices, the cost of things, the equipment, the machinery, uh, it's it just not, not feasible. The Weeborgs are now among the biggest cattle ranches in Nebraska, with over 2,500 acres and 17,000 cattle. My, my great-grandparents and my grandparents, when they were young, uh, came over here as immigrants, and then they came to Nebraska and homesteaded in an area just, just a couple miles away from the feedlot here. And our uh, family has been in this area ever since. Using big ag economies of scale, the Weeborgs are now able to invest in state-of-the-art technology. Each truck has uh, the ingredients and the pounds for several pens of cattle that are loaded on it, and the feed truck driver weighs out specific pounds to each pen, and that is uh, uh, wirelessly transmitted to our office where it goes into our, our uh, cattle program and billing system. Small versus big, it is a global debate, and Kent reckons he knows whose side history is on. I think the trend is for more farms and the farms to be larger. The tension between big and small ag in America and across the world was investigated in a special UN report on the right to food. There is a tension between small-scale farming and, and large-scale agro-industrial farming. Large-scale farms are more competitive. They are able to sell food at lower prices on markets because they do achieve economies of scale, which are difficult to achieve when you're a small farm. But small farms deliver a number of services for which they should be rewarded. They are better at managing the ecosystems. They are usually more efficient in using the natural resources. And there are many studies showing that the smaller the farm, the more productive it is per hectare, they need to be better organized in order to achieve some of the benefits of the large-scale enterprises, but small-scale farming is, is quite essential in a world of scarce resources. It's in Washington, D.C., where the big versus small ag battles fought politically. John Hansen organizes small-scale farmers in Nebraska and represents them to Congress. My goal is to try to help create a level playing field for family farmers and ranchers. We're not asking for special treatment. 
We're just asking for fair treatment. Oh, we gotta go to the north door. It's politicians who mediate between big and small ag. In the USA, that's via a farm bill passed every five years, like this year. John wants better protection for small farmers. He says big ag monopolies are distorting markets across the world. Well, I'm going to talk to my home congressman about, uh, about the farm bill, what he's hearing about it, and uh, we're going to break apart all of the different pieces of it and try to see if there's any of those pieces that he might be able to help us uh, get so moved forward. Going up. What's your first name? John. Last name? Hanson, H-A-N-S-E-N. I've been doing farm bills ever since 1972. I never give up. I never quit. And I never take a hard no. I just keep working. That's what I do. Let's see. The farmer's share of the food dollar has shrunk significantly uh, in the last 30 years as, as we have seen the proliferation of less competition and as we get fewer and fewer corporations, we see more and more marketplace manipulation, and we see uh, any economies of scale being offset by just good old plain price gouging and profit taking that goes on when you have a non-competitive marketing system. Yes, let me out. So, let, let me out so you can go in. Yes. Uh, I met with his staff, with his legislative assistant, and we went over all of the particulars of both policy and process. Uh, it, was, it was a very positive. Governmental regulation is the key to competition because if truth be told, companies don't really want competition. They want to get rid of competition, develop market share, and milk the advantages of a non-competitive market with their few remaining partners. The biggest single problem that we have now in hunger is poverty. It is not a, the amount of food production. And so let's not hide behind uh, different kinds of fears or phobias. Let's talk about how we develop a more economically beneficial and sustainable food production system in the world. In a Washington cafe, a chance for Nebraska's small farmers leader to globalize his arguments. Nobel laureate Mohan Munasinghe has researched whether big or small farms are best placed to feed the world. Okay. Shall we order first? Yeah. Iced tea for me, please. Um, just water. The pendulum should not swing too far in favor of the large farms. They have certain advantages, but the large agribusinesses are using uh, world conditions, the price volatility, the economic collapse, uh, climate change, and all the problems which are squeezing out for small farmers are being used by large agribusinesses to expand their role. I mean, this is a natural thing. Uh, any, any large business would do that. So I think it is uh, very important for governments to find the right balance, which will vary from country to country. You have a general problem which is global, but the solutions have to be local. And this is where the big and the small have to be brought into balance. Because you need uh, bigger entities, maybe it could be governments, it could be big companies, who have a bigger perspective from a global, global point of view. But you need the small businesses and the small operators and the small communities who have to act locally in terms of the local conditions. But Big Ag fears regulations that help small farmers can interfere with the free market that's helped the US become the world's biggest cattle and grain exporter. It's big government, says Big Ag, which will stop us feeding the future. You know, I believe in capitalism. You cannot manipulate the markets. That's what true capitalism is. The thing we've got to watch out is over-regulation by our government that would stifle our, our productivity. You know, the government should not prevent you from being successful, and it should not prevent you from failing either. 
and I think a lot of people want to have a government to prevent some people from failing. Uh, I don't believe in that. It, it's a matter of, of keeping up and changing and, and being more productive. It, it's evolution. Big Ag employs lobbyists like Justin Wilson. He's from a small Midwest farm himself, but he says the days of small farms feeding the world are limited. The number of farmers in the United States is shrinking dramatically. We're getting more efficient. We're keeping food affordable. And we're doing that through innovation and continuing a long trend of research. And so I think people are going to have to understand that in order for us to keep feeding the world, because it's important, obviously, that we're going to have to come to terms with this idea that not everything that we eat is going to be, you know, every morning have a, the farmer wake up every morning and pet it and give it a hug and touch it and make it feel good because that is, we don't have enough people, we don't have enough land. But for small farmers like Ron, Big Ag offers the consumer less choice, putting corporate profit before consumer interests. Big Ag will say, well, consumers have a choice. They can either buy from the small producer, but a lot of the people who are, don't have the money, they, they buy food the cheapest way they can, but it's not always the healthiest food. And so that's what leads to the obesity and diabetes and all those issues. In a globalized world, Ron knows the big versus small ag debate echoes way beyond Nebraska. He's offering a new piece to the local paper. If Ron Meyer were to write a letter and it was about globalization and agriculture, we'd certainly consider it. Um, I mean, global markets are, uh, that's just agriculture today and what farmers and other countries are doing uh, affects what farmers in Nebraska are doing. Ron's discovering the world's small farms are more important than he'd thought. Over two and a half billion people, or 40 percent of the world's population, work on small farms. Most working on farms far smaller than Ron's 400 acres. Ron's contacting IFAD, the UN agency assisting small-scale farmers, at their country office in Cameroon, West Africa. Are you, are you seeing us? Uh, I am now, yes, very much so, okay. Can you see us very well? Yes, I can. I can see you very well now, yes. And, and this is Nadine. You're Hi. Nadine. Hi. <laughs> Hi. And this is Valentine. This is Valentine. From Cameroon. Uh, okay, yeah, this is Ron. Uh, I was wondering, in a, a growing global population with 9 billion people, can the small farmer do you feel that the small farmer is the best way to feed that growing population? Oh yes, I think that uh, you, you, may, you may understand. We small farmers, are, they can really feed the population because you know that uh, big farms, they always do on what we call uh, cash crop, that are farms that you use to, to export products. But if you look at uh, small farms, they are there to feed the population. Okay. You know, our country is not very different from uh, what you people have in USA eh? because farmers are the same all over. In our country, you know, most of the time, especially these uh, middlemen that they call buy and sell them, that is two people who come and buy from the farm and go and sell, they make a lot of money because uh, farmers, small farmers are not informed about the price. Small farmers don't have the means of transportation, so they rely totally on, uh, on middlemen. Ron learns Cameroon still relies on small farmers. But he's surprised to hear they're just as concerned they get a raw deal from the system. Ron? Yes. It's a challenge. Um, the main issue we are, we are facing is basically um, most, some, most of the production usually doesn't go to the market and gets wasted. Basically, um, they have issues of storage infrastructure, they have issues of, of marketing infrastructure, they have issues of, of roads to get to the main market. So um, it is a big issue and it's also defeating for farmers not to be able to get their production to the market. So uh, this requires a, a government policy, government investment, because it goes beyond, beyond the farmers and we are talking of community and national investment. Yeah, I think what you said earlier about the middlemen taking 
a lot of the profits away and trying to direct market. That's the same problems we face here in the United States, too. So I think we have very similar problems. Uh, After talking to these small farmers in the Cameroon, I can see that the whole concept of globalization that American farmers are indoctrinated with is a myth because we cannot feed the world. The only people that can feed the world is the small farmers within their own countries who produce food that local people eat. And, uh, and I guess my article, I would like to reiterate that and somehow try to convince our own farmers that it's in everyone's best interest to, to produce locally and not always think about globally. If we leave it to the market forces, if states do not um, make it a priority to support small farms, small farms will be gradually wiped out, simply because they are less competitive. They are less good at capturing markets uh, because they produce uh, uh, for, uh, at, a more, at a higher cost, uh, whatever they can produce for the markets. And so it's very important that we are aware of the positive externalities, the benefits that small farms um, have and produce and, and that we support them for the services that they deliver. Studies show that between 50 and 70% of the world's population are fed by small farmers. So who does the research suggest should be feeding the future? One of the big questions in the world is how much indigenous or local farmers can feed broader populations. Um, there's been a lot of research on this and there's open debate about it. Some companies and some other individuals in agricultural research think that it's only the large scale farming that can feed the world. But there are a number of studies that show that smaller scale farming can, can feed a larger area. If small farms do offer an alternative, some experts say they'll have to develop new techniques and values of their own. It's what small farmers in the agroecology movement are trying to do. Agroecology is an attempt to use ecological methods to produce food products. It uses multiple inputs, but they're natural inputs. It uses not monocrops, but polycrops. The future farming, I think, has a number of trajectories. One of those would be this more holistic attempt and interest by people to be part of a community that is biodiverse, that produces complicated foods, that produces good food. TV, Central and Western Nebraska's most watched evening news. This is NTV News at 6. From London to Central Nebraska, an international film crew shines a spotlight on a local ranch. Nebraska farmer Kevin Fulton didn't always cuddle chickens. He's a former heavyweight wrestler, now a medium-sized farmer. He and Ron are coming to grips with agroecology. Like Vietnam vet Ron, Kevin's hardly a hippie, but he is proving a successful alternative farmer. You know, people think of a big industrial agriculture as uh, intensive agriculture, but what we're doing here is way more intensive we can raise, we can produce just as much livestock running them on pasture systems as we can in these huge confinement systems. It's going to take more land, it's going to take a different mindset, of course. But we produce an uh, uh, incredible amount of, of food right here on my farm, and we don't put animals in cages or crates. On our farm, we don't bring in manures from outside sources, we don't bring in uh, chemical fertilizers at all we found out that we could actually produce more. We've had to learn how to farm again, had to learn how to you know, understand the biology of the soil, how to understand how, you know, animal behavior and how to manage multiple groups of different species of animals working together. But once you master that, I mean, you've, you realize you can produce way more than you ever could conventionally using the sustainable and organic methods that we're now using. Uh, I apologize for this no. mess, but uh, been awfully busy. And I, think I started cleaning last night, my kids were helping me. And we didn't get, <laughs> we didn't get. <laughs> my grandparents came over here to farm in 1900 and they came from Northern Ireland near Belfast. We use a lot of the same concepts that, you know, maybe my grandfather used. Uncle that was living in this period. Well, 
we can use those concepts, but we can apply them using modern technology, and that allows us to get the best of both worlds. And I have interns in here that are on the internet every night looking at uh, different things and trying to figure out problems. It's a it's a it's a problem solving type uh, environment, and that's that's very stimulating, really. You know, if if, if we had put as much money into research for um, eco agriculture as we have into big ag commodity agriculture. Well, we'd be in a whole other ball game right now. Yeah, a whole other ball game. We are looking hard at, at, at what's going on around the world and, and trying to borrow concepts from other people. I mean, we've taken grazing techniques and stuff that are used in Australia and New Zealand and those kinds of things. So uh, it's a big world out there. we got a long way to go. government has a role to play here in moving away from industrial agriculture and fostering the kind of farming environment that is about sustainable agriculture. I think that with the right kind of policy environment, with an investment in you know, you know, sort of first-rate science uh, that is agroecological and that, that, that pays attention to the environment and to labor concerns and to sustainability concerns, we can feed the world absolutely involving uh, by, by working with small farmers to improve the kinds of agriculture they're doing at the moment. With some support from the government and imaginative new ways of farming, maybe small ag won't be overwhelmed by big ag after all. If you give up hope and you say, oh, we have to leave it to the big players to do it, it will never happen because the big players continue to maintain the status quo and that is in their nature. You can't blame them because if things are good for them, why would they want to change? So it is the people at the bottom who are feeling the pinch, who have to organize themselves and say, look, hey, you know, we have to have some changes. It doesn't, and they have to put pressure on their elected representatives to make the kinds of change that they want. Meantime, Ron's not just farming and campaigning, he's also helping distribute food parcels to Nebraska's poor. Even in the heartland of Big Ag, there are still hungry mouths to feed, and there'll be plenty more in the future. We like to think we're feeding the world, but that's a myth. It's not happening. We, we, I, with all the technology, we still have hungry people in the world. <laughs>